Welcome, folks, and uh, good afternoon. My name is Jake Milstein. I guess good afternoon, unless you're in Alaska or Hawaii. Uh, it's nice to see you here today. We're going to be talking about safeguarding manufacturing. Um, you know, I think we have seen in the past couple of months, um, you know, the ransomware terrorists, and yes, I do call them ransomware terrorists, really going after manufacturing. We've seen, you know, we've seen a bunch of problems, uh, uh, um, you know, ransomware uh, as one, uh, data exfiltration, we've seen all sorts of things. Um, and we'll talk about why that is uh, as we come up here. Um, but for folks uh, uh, just joining us, I want to say hi and welcome. Um, and we're very, uh, very excited to have you join us today. Um, some things to know if you haven't been to our uh, our, our webinars before. Uh, there's a chat on the right. You can ask us any question. Uh, as I say in every one of our discussions, my favorite thing to do is to inter is to interrupt the speakers with your questions. So feel free to throw in your questions. I would love to interrupt them. Um, also, uh, anyone who registered will get a recording of this from the system. We'll also put it on our YouTube channel, um, and we will send you the slide deck. Um, if you don't know us, uh, Critical Insight Defends Critical Infrastructure um, and manufacturing uh, organizations are definitely uh, critical infrastructure here. You know, you, you keep uh, you keep the country going um, and, uh, you know, there was no more proof of that than many of the things that happened in the pandemic, of course. Uh, and so we help manufacturing organizations prepare for a cyber attack with risk assessments, pen tests, uh, VCSO, regulatory compliance, um, preparing for audits, uh, detecting an attack quickly with our security operations center, um, and responding decisively. Make sure you get those bad guys out. Um, our, uh, our SOC team helps with that, as does our incident response team. Uh, joining me today is Mike and Fred. Michael Hamilton is the founder, as is uh, Fred. Uh, Mike is our CISO, and he's the former CISO of the city of Seattle. Fred is our is currently our chief product officer. He's run our consulting organization for a long time. And John Luke Peck is joining us today. He's worked with a lot of manufacturing organizations on their risk assessments, but also incident response, uh, which is not how we like to meet anybody, but it happens and we're here for you. Uh, and when I say we, I really mean John Luke Peck. Uh, and my name is Jake Milstein. I uh, run marketing and host the events. Um, and it is great to see you today. Um, Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the issues in manufacturing uh, in terms of cyber? I do. That's actually why I'm here. That's good because we're yeah. counting on you for this. Okay. Well, so this is, there are statistics all over the place. And I think, you know, a lot of us that are in, you know, information security, you know, we are a little constrained to think about our own sector and some of the things that would bump up against us. And so, you know, here at CI, we intentionally work for um, vertical sectors that we think influence our quality of life at the scale we actually live it. And it turns out that the top three uh, attacked sectors are local government, health, and we work extensively with those, and manufacturing. And so there's a lot of statistics around and i think you know as a group we're not enough engaged in the manufacturing sector and it covers a lot of things there's a lot of commonalities between manufacturing and for example utilities right water waste treatment things like that so you see the statistics here an 87 percent increase in ransomware attacks all right there is a reason for that um two-thirds of executives think they're going to be attacked well you're probably right um, you know, this is really a foreseeable event at this point and really good preparedness that Jake was talking about is getting ready to take that punch. Uh, more than 38% expect losses from 20 to 50 million. So when we say that uh, uh, a manufacturing organization expects losses, if they are publicly traded, they have to report that as a risk, right, in 10Q filings. And you know, there some of them think that if they get if and when they get hit, their losses are going to be 50 to 100 million dollars. So those are pretty big numbers. And we have seen recently um, uh, some manufacturing and manufacturing like organizations get hit with ransomware. Recently, we've seen uh, NVIDIA. I think that was January 2022. 
NVIDIA, you think of them as sound cards. They're really semiconductor fabrication at this point. AMD, Acer, Foxconn, right? These are all technical, you know, electronics manufacturing, uh, semiconductor fab fabrication, things like that. Let's go to the next slide, Jake, and let's look at even more statistics. But these are from IBM. IBM did a really good dive into this. Um, when stuff starts, there's not a whole lot of ways that it starts. Somebody trips over a booby trapped website, somebody gives up their credentials, somebody breaks into the network because uh, you have failed to patch a vulnerability. Well, 33% increase has to do with organizations that don't patch. And when we say patch, yes, we're talking about your internet exposed information technology, your exchange server, whatever. Um, it's also programmable logic controllers and things that are inside a manufacturing um, floor that uh, automate a lot of the process. Um, most common, phishing. Somebody gave up a password, right? The second uh, ex most exploited vulnerability was Log4j, which is embedded in lots of things. And this was a very, very big story about a year ago. Um, those vulnerabilities linger out there and will continue to be exploited. Um, uh, manufacturing most targeted in terms of OT networks, right? So manufacturing more than dams, water, some of the other things. I mean, when we look at the food and ag sector, you know, I would say that JBS meets from a couple of years ago, right around Memorial Day or whenever that was, you know, they share a lot with manufacturing. And so we know that that was critical infrastructure that got hit as well. Um, and then you can see all of the, the rest of the statistics on what kind of TTPs, tools, tactics, procedures that they use. 30% were ransomware attacks, 36% were ransomware attacks. Some were going after servers, some were denial of service, and others were credential harvesting just to steal passwords. Uh, insiders have been bribed to uh, facilitate access, et cetera, et cetera. All right. But the big thing there, 36% were extortion, right? Ransomware extortion. And unfortunately, in manufacturing, you don't have those juicy records around that people could steal and then just hold on to and say, pay us and we'll give you your data back or we'll destroy it because you don't collect the kind of information that lends itself to that kind of value, right? Where if it was disclosed in an unauthorized way, you're bumping up against the California Consumer Privacy Act and all of the rest of the state privacy statutes where they're going to come in with a class action suit after that. So you don't have those records, which is good, but I do know that manufacturing is starting to collect more data and it is a real double-edged sword, especially if you're going to monetize data like that. So that's kind of the lay of the land statistically, what's going on, what fraction of attacks are trying to extort you for money, how big of a target you are, et cetera, et cetera. So go to the next slide, Jake, and I think we should talk about why you're such a great target. Everybody wants to know why they're a great target. Uh, yeah, well, well, apparently target is a great target. Um, the, the more that you smarten up your uh, manufacturing floor, the more technology you add to create efficiencies, the bigger your attack surface is. And so these things are just being exploited. Eventually, we think um, this situation will be abated because the federal government has come out with a national cybersecurity strategy. And what they're trying to do is move the, um, the liability for uh, uh, what goes wrong at a network away from the end user and to the manufacturer of the product that went bad. So, you know, all of this stuff eventually, and IoT, and I know that there's, you know, industrial IoT is, is a large part of um, uh, telemetry and keeping um, SCADA and other automation operations going. Um, um, IoT in particular uh, the federal government wants it to come out with a seal of approval, right? This thing is secure out of the box. There is a uh, process to discover vulnerabilities, to transmit th that information out to the users, and to provide patches and updates to keep that stuff secure. So for sure, when the federal government gets all this moving and it, we start looking at some kind of success in this initiative, 
that situation is going to back off a little bit. Unfortunately, Congress has to get involved because there's a liability framework that has to be created for the manufacturers. And I know Congress isn't going to want to do that. So in today's world, it is what it is. The more of this stuff you add to the network to make your operation more and more efficient, the bigger of a target you are. You do have intellectual property and you do have stealable records. They may not be consumer personally identifiable information, but you have W-2 records, you know, you have employee records, things like that. Most importantly, it's because manufacturing in particular knows how to estimate or calculate um, the dollar loss per minute if you lose access to the manufacturing floor and everything has to stop, right? For sure, GM knows on a per minute basis. If that automobile construction line stops, what that's going to cost. So criminals know this. They know that you are going to lose tons of money if they are able to snarl you and 36% of those attacks are using ransomware. That makes you a great target and very likely to pay that extortion demand. Also, same as other sectors, same as government, same as healthcare, same as apparently everybody else but the finance sector, very poor access to qualified practitioners to be in there to help you secure your IT and OT networks. And then there is the fact that you are part of a gigantic supply chain and something that happens um, down your supply chain is going to affect you. And planning for that both in terms of here's how you evaluate third party risk, but also what's our fallback plan if we lose a key provider uh, of some supply that we really need. Uh, uh, very important. And so uh, I will call out critical manufacturing here as something a little different. It's actually got a definition from the federal government. There's this big ecosystem of critical infrastructure protection, 16 sectors called out. One of those is critical manufacturing. So you can see it's the things, it's not widgets, it's rail cars and aircraft and things like this. Yeah, and, and, I, and I think, you know, Mike, one of the really important things that we dig into a lot is the, the, the fourth point here, the poor access to qualified cyber practitioners. You know, I, you know, I know we have a bunch, we, I can see the folks in the audience, we have some really strong IT directors, we have, you know, some strong CISOs, but, you know, my guess, and, and the folks want to answer in the chat, I'm curious, you know, finding, finding other folks, uh, you know, is increasingly difficult. Um, and Fred, we've seen this as a difficulty for years. Yeah. Well, I, th I think one of the biggest problems in manufacturing is it's a little different, the monitoring and the systems you're looking at, than you would see in a regular IT operation. A lot of these systems speak in serial protocols or protocols that were not as IT professionals used to looking at and understanding those and how they uh, maybe are indicators of compromise is a whole new set of skills that you're going to have to bring to an operational technology infrastructure. So it's, it's, it's a very different, I mean, the same base skills, but the systems you're working on work very differently. You have to understand those and it's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I am curious, you know, if folks have the same issues that we see in other sectors, you know, it's hard to find people, it's hard to retain them. Uh, and then, you know, retaining them involves, you know, proper training and everything. Um, you know, that that's something that we see, you know, across sectors, but, you know, especially here uh, because of sort of the different skill set that Fred was talking about. Yep. So let's talk a little bit about uh, why are these all kind of tied together? Why, why are all these things part of a risk horizon that you need to consider all sorts of different components? As Mike mentioned, this is part of a an infrastructure of manufacturing, right? People either take parts that are created by other companies, assemble those, manufacture those, turn those into products, or they're producing those raw components, or maybe they're producing middle pieces, you know, pieces uh, that will then be bought by other companies and incorporated into products. Any place along this supply chain, things can go wrong. The bad guys may be attacking you, a maker of bolts, because the bolts that you make happen to also be used in an F 35 fighter jet, right? So it may not be because you're anything but a key cog in a much bigger wheel that they're trying to disrupt, right? So the Russians, if you're in any way related to the creation of arms or supplies for the military, 
you're going to be right now, you're absolutely going to be a target. So you, you just have to be in that supply chain to be part of the problem. Uh, what else, what else is also kind of a part of this is uh, your interruptions may not be with suppliers. It may not be IT. You may be disrupted when they have an attack on the power grid or they decide to go after the water and you can't get water to run your uh, water cutting uh, jets uh, for your manufacturing plant. So there's this whole concept of if I'm thinking about a cyber attack, I have to think not just against me. I have to think about a cyber attack against the regional utilities and infrastructure that I rely on. The same thing can go for if they attack the traffic management systems and I'm reliant on a just-in-time manufacturing model that needs big semi-trucks pulling in and out 24 hours a day. If that is disrupted, then my manufacturing will be disrupted. These things are all cyber attack related. These are things that are not attacks against you. They're attacks against these critical services that you need to operate your organization. So you need to think about not just do I have a backup generator, but if I need water to run my processes, where is that water going to come from if the bad guys step in and cut it off? Yeah, I think one of the one of the key points on here, too, is the, you know, geographic concentration. You know, rather than a big distributed operation, your manufacturing is like in one place. And so it's a little harder to be resilient when you don't have a failover location, you know, where you can continue to, to operate. You know, that's part of it, too. And I, and I would say of the, the dependencies there on the right, communication is a big one. Um, it's um, there's constant communication needed between all of the pieces of, you know, especially robotic manufacturing. There's constant telemetry and things are self tuning all the time. That's uh, you know, snarling communications is the easiest way to get things to stop. Yeah. And, and another challenge there is so much uh, now is uh, so much manufacturing receives remote telemetry from uh, devices or systems or vehicles in the field. Like we do a lot of security for vehicle manufacturers. And as you probably know, they're using a combination of wireless networks, mesh networks and radios to continuously beam telemetry back from the vehicles. So they know performance issues, things to fix, maintenance issues that may crop up. So if you lose that ability to communicate, that's a big deal. Now, what, what is a good example of this? Well, you might know that Sierra Wireless, one of the biggest providers of radio networks for people to connect and, and connect all these OT and remote plant devices, well, they had a major outage over the last couple of weeks. One of the, the, the single major provider for this was down for a couple of days. That means all these manufacturing operations, all these infield telemetry operations, they weren't working because what the main provider there was no longer uh, operational for a couple of days. So there's these interdependencies of your service providers, these underlying technologies that move the data around, how your things are connected both from a physical, logical, and potentially a wireless perspective. You have to think about all these components because every one of them are targeted by the bad guys. Any of them breaks, it breaks your manufacturing operation. As Mike talked about over here on, on the, on the right-hand side, you need to think about what are the things that you need to ensure are going to be uh, uh, available in your supply chain, right? Manufacturing is the raw materials, the bolts, the nuts, the coal, whatever it is that goes in the front end, or the ability to pull all these suppliers together. Energy and water, you need to make sure if I'm running um, a dam, I need to make sure I've got power to make sure I can operate the controls on that dam, likewise for water or for energy. Communications and IT. Everybody needs some level of communication, whether it's part of your OT or just part of your business communications. We mentioned transportation systems. If the roads are unpassable, uh, and that's a target in a cyber war, they will attack our traffic management systems and try to shut down uh, commerce. Um, and then chemical. We all you know, know about the bad things that can happen if there's a chemical leak. We also remember uh, about two years ago, there was a water system in Florida that a bad guy was able to uh, gain a foothold on and started turning up the chlorine in the water to a level to where it would have been toxic. Now they caught it before people were hurt, but that's an example where somebody could take over something in a plant and cause a terrorist event by releasing hydrogen cyanide, sulfuric acid, whatever it may be into the atmosphere by taking over a process controller turning up something all the way and getting a runaway condition where this stuff starts leaking out. Yeah. And luckily on that one, 
uh i mean there wasn't a big vulnerability there was a if i remember right mike there was just a shared password in team viewer uh You're talking about the oldsmar one? yeah uh-huh right? no that was a doofus banging on a keyboard who caused that it was an operator at the plant and then reported it as we got hacked that's what that <laughs> oh was. Was, that changed yeah 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 mm -hmm. all right all right. So what kind of threats uh, are you facing? As Mike mentioned, uh, ransomware, that threat of extortion, um, that's kind of usually a double prong threat. There will be data stolen first, and uh, then they will uh, launch the ransomware attack. If you do not pay the ransom for the ransomware attack, then they're going to threaten you secondarily by saying, we're going to release your data to the black market or the, the dark web, and we're going to expose everybody's personal information or your uh, your uh, who you're a vendor to or you're a supplier to, we're going to uh, let their trade secrets on how they use your product out in the world. All these kinds of things you don't want out in there. This is a very 36% uh, I thought was a little low because manufacturing, the best thing you can do to extort money out of manufacturing is stop manufacturing, right? So if they want to make money and that's what the entire motivation around ransomware is, is to go out and make money. Uh, that makes you a target, right? It's the weakest link that's the target, not the biggest target. In fact, the bigger targets are probably more well secured than the smaller one. And so they are looking for you if you're a small manufacturer, you are the target, as opposed to thinking 10 years ago, well, be, why would they come after me? Well, I'm telling you, they are coming after you exactly because you're small and it's harder for you to secure your stuff. Then they may just go after, um, your ability to do business, right? They may cut off your internet connections by blasting a ton of data at maybe a site-to-site -site VPN you have and cut off your ability to communicate to a remote plant. Uh, you may say this doesn't happen much. Well, I can tell you if you had trouble with O365 last week or Azure, Microsoft suffered through a major denial of service attack last week, degraded service across the globe. That in itself, if you rely on O365 email, could have disrupted your business. So that's an attack on one of the utilities, the email system that you use, uh, happened last week, right? If it had been any worse, you could have been uh, not uh, doing business at that time. They may also go for, because you probably have a lot of accounts payable, you got a lot of suppliers, you're paying a lot of suppliers. That means you have an accounts payable department that is moving a lot of money between a lot of paying accounts and receiving accounts. Well, if they're able to compromise the credentials of that individual and accounts payable, they can sit and watch what's happening in that email. And if they see uh, your person saying, getting ready to say, hey, we've, uh, we need you to deposit this uh, payment into this account, they will jump in and they will change that account number to their account number in the Ukraine. And then your unfortunate suspecting victim, your supplier, that you sent this invoice to, well, they'll pay an account in Ukraine and you will not get your money and they will lose their money and everybody will be uh, out in that case. So business email compromise and the fraud it enables, huge risk, definitely one that everybody that has any amount of uh, accounts payable going on, a key, key component there. They may come in and just decide to destroy things. If you're a defense contractor or you're providing something that is key to uh, the supply chain, say for energy or for oil and gas, uh, you may be a target by a nation state that wants to harm our ability to produce oil and gas or energy or things like that. So they may come in and just completely wipe, erase everything you have. It's a kind of an extension of the ransomware component, but we're just not going to make it recoverable. There is no way to recover it. We're just going to wipe it all away. And, so, and by the way, and one note on 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 wipers, Mike and I have seen, you know, sometimes they'll act like it's ransomware and you'll pay a ransom and then there will be nothing there. Yeah, exactly. It's just once they have your money, then it's just easier to erase your data at that point and let you suffer. So, yeah. And then, as I mentioned, there's all the con concepts of supply chain disruption. Where upstream is, is your ability to get your goods to the next step in the supply chain or out to the consumers? understand those risks, right? What happens before, what happens after you do everything you do and understand those things. And then there's the attacker in the middle, or, you know, there's a lot of ways to, to term that, but it's somebody who is now 
uh, able to watch what is going on in the network, for example, and watch your commands coming from a, let's say it's a process control uh, console that controls the manufacturing process. If they're able to watch what is happening as it goes by, they can actually inject their own traffic into the middle or change the traffic before it gets to the endpoint to do something different than what your console commanded it to do. This is one of the ways that they would execute one of those. I want to release, you know, sulfuric acid into the atmosphere. I want to run that pump at a rate that will break a million dollars worth of equipment because it will then run at a high rate of speed and all fall apart. So these are ways that they can get into the middle of the communications and change what's being communicated. One thing to know about, manufacturing and operational technology, most of the OT protocols have no ability to encrypt that traffic. You can see and read what happens if you're sitting on the wire and you can make changes and inject traffic. They are not robust protocols like the IT protocols we use. These are protocols built in the 1980s that we're still using today. And I would say this whole business about faking out process control, there's a very famous example of this with centrifuges. Yes, yeah, exactly. So right. there was- Ura Uranium, uranium processing. Mm -hmm. Correct, yeah, one of, the, one of the most famous hacks of all time. Uh, and even in the, it was one of the most secure facilities in the world, there was no outside connectivity and uh, probably Israeli agents with the help of uh, American hackers built a uh, an attack kit, put it on a USB drive that they set outside the facility. Somebody picked it up, walked inside the facility and plugged it in and said, cool, I have a new USB drive. And it immediately attacked the centrifuges, caused them to spin at a super high rate of speed and explode. And we set back their nuclear program about four or five years uh, with that one hacking activity. And made so, them real mad too. Made them real mad. But that shows even our government is really good at doing this. We're actually, other governments are doing this quite a bit. It doesn't get publicized very much because it's very scary stuff. So we keep it kind of under our hat. Um, you, you, know, you, thing, you say that, you say that, but more and more bulletins have been coming out lately. The frequency of the bulletins coming out from FBI and CISA about um, uh, threats to operational technology are coming more frequently. Absolutely. No doubt about it. Yep. And what other things are, are kind of the areas or the attack vectors that the bad guys use? Well, anytime uh, users are accessing the internet, you know, you're walking out into the minefield of cesspool of malware and uh, compromised sites that you can get drive by uh, compromises. If you're uh, working on a system that has critical function and you're using an account that has administrative access, do not be out surfing the internet, doing personal email, going to Facebook, Okay, those things are best done, as Mike will say, on your cell phone, your personal device. Um, you know, only access the internet. We need to connect to the vendor's uh, site to get their latest manual on how this stuff operates. Unpatched applications. Well, one thing we know about operational technology, sadly, um, the life cycle of operational technology is usually about 15 years. Well, if you think about IT technology, a laptop is meant to last three years. And that means if they're upgraded, in other words, the security levels, the security components and controls are all upgraded if you buy and replace these things every three years, which is their standard life cycle. Well, something that's 15 years old, you're getting the security of 2008 in a system in 2023. Everybody knows that's not going to that's not going to fly. So if you're not upgrading or have the ability to patch these applications or bring them up to some modern level of security, and sticking with the old paradigm of this stuff should last 15 years, you're going to have to find some way to segment all that off because it's going to be vulnerable. There's nothing you're going to be able to do about it. And then there's the remote access tools. Um, it's not uncommon for ConnectWise or some tool that you connect to connect into your environment. If I am able to fish and get somebody's credentials, well, then I can also use that VPN because it uses the same credentials. And I can use those to now launch an uh, a session of my own, and then do whatever that particular user's privilege privileges allowed them to do, I can now do on your network. If it's an administrator, I own your network and everything inside of it. So remote access needs to be managed. Authentication 
for these types of things like remote access or administrative access should have multi-factor authentication, right? You should have two things, your phone with a code and your username and password, right? So all these things need to be thought of as avenues of attack. And these are the bad things that can happen if they take advantage of vulnerabilities. All right, I'll take this one. Okay. Uh, so uh, regulation is coming and regulation is already here. So if, so CMMC, the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification, this is uh, one example and there, there are and there will be more examples of the federal government using the power of the purse to get the security they want. So in today's world, if you are a manufacturer that does business with the Department of Defense uh, or another federal agency that's acting on behalf of the Department of Defense, you have to go through a certification process and you have to achieve a level of maturity that is commensurate with the, the uh, opportunity on which you want to bid. So if that opportunity is, I don't know, we're going to do uh, new flooring in uh, a government building. All right, well, that, that's not a big deal. Um, if you uh, uh, create bolts with a special coating that can be used in space on spy satellites, yeah, you're in scope. And eventually this is going to roll downhill as the federal government is now starting to um, uh, bring in more federal agencies and instruct them when you spend money, security is a competitive differentiator in the products and the services that you buy. So today, CMMC is already a thing, and that's being extended by the federal government in part with the national cybersecurity strategy, which again is about moving the responsibility for securing product in, in particular away from the end users of that product onto the manufacturers of that product. So all that's coming. And by the time it gets here, there's going to be a whole lot of requirements for companies to show your security papers if you're going to do business with anybody in the federal government and all that trickles downhill. So eventually, right, the end state is everybody is showing everybody else your security papers just to do business. And we're almost there now. Um, the SEC, if you are a publicly traded manufacturing organization, like some of the ones I rolled off that have been hit, um, you are required to talk about these kinds of risks in your 10Q filings. Um, they are requiring uh, a, a greater level of governance um, for security and to the extent that that has to bubble up to the board and the board has to be informed about these risks. Um, there is a, 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 a event reporting that says quarterly reporting. That's more about your 10Q filings. If you have an incident, they want that incident reported within four days. There's a lot of pushback on that because that becomes very hard to do with any kind of authoritative knowledge of what actually happened. So the SEC is getting into the act. The Federal Trade Commission, if your public pronouncements about your security are not consistent with your practices after there's some kind of event and Federal Trade Commission comes in and has a look around and your insurance company is in there. They bring in the smoke jumpers and the incident responders with Q-tips and toothpicks and they find out that your uh, the claims that you made about how seriously you take security uh, were not accurate, then they fine you against the False Claims Act. This is becoming more and more frequent. Mainly, this is happening uh, when the uh, unauthorized disclosure is protected records, specifically those that have an impact on personal privacy. That's really where the False Claims Act is being uh, leveraged right now as an enforcement tool, but it is applicable in a lot of places and manufacturing is not going to be immune from that. Um, there's the entire ecosystem of uh, critical infrastructure protection. And so at one point a few years ago, I was vice chair of a government coordinating council for state, local, tribal, and territorial governments. Um, all of the critical sectors are supposed to have the following. Uh, government coordinating council, where you sit down with the government and talk about things. A sector coordinating council, where it's just you and your peers and competitors talking about things. Um, uh, an ISAC, an information sharing and analysis organization or uh, center, 
um, and a sector specific agency. So the sector specific agency for um, critical manufacturing is CISA itself. For the water sector, it's the EPA, right? For several other sectors, there is little carve outs within Homeland Security. So, for example, uh, uh, maritime ports, it is the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard is actually under Department of Homeland Security. Well, CISA is under Department of Homeland Security, and they inherited the responsibility for being that sector specific agency um, just because there was no other good choices in there. Uh, but that means they get to set some rules. And so if you are in critical manufacturing and we rolled off the those critical things that you would be manufacturing, these guys are starting to hand out regulatory requirements, not quite regulatory requirements, but uh, they have regulatory purview. And in all of these things going on, the areas of emphasis are for sure governance. You've got to have some kind of committee, some kind of organization within your business where risks are ident identified and then they're brought out and they say, are we going to do something about this? Are we going to accept this risk? Are we going to transfer this through insurance? What are we going to do? And get everybody's fingerprints on that because you don't want to be the one that by yourself made the call, we are going to accept this risk, have something happen, and then have no other fingerprints on it but yours. That yeah, I mean, one of the... Way. You know, one of the greatest phrases an old boss gave me was, you know, if you go out on a limb, take somebody with you. Yeah. So this is kind of how regulation is shaping up. Some of this is actual regulatory. Some of this is standards of practice that are being strongly advocated by the federal government. For the example, the use of the NIST cybersecurity framework to uh, perform a risk assessment of yourself and find your control gaps and things like that. And they're getting more and more serious as time goes on. And the events of the last two weeks are only reinforcing these things, right? The uh, the move it file transfer vulnerability and the hundreds and hundreds of organizations that have been crushed. Um, you know, this is this is going to leave a mark. Every every once in a while, there's one of these events, and what it does is it spurs a bit more national policy to come out. And eventually, we can get to the place where. Instead of saying, okay, everybody secure your networks, the government's going to say, okay, we got it. We got the border controlled now, and bad guys don't get in anymore. And that's kind of where we need to land someday. We're not there today. Awesome. That, uh, you know, one of the things about the board level representation, uh, and I was just talking to somebody at, at one of our customers, is, you know, it took an it took a cyber event to happen. It had, you know, they they had to get management by landline. Yep. Yeah, and and you know, one of the reasons we do these is to give people information so they do not have to have that happen to, uh, you know, to to start creating the right controls. You know, one of the things that that uh, you mentioned there was, um, you know, governance, and we're going to get to the NIST CSF and the addition of governance there in a little bit. But let's, uh, let's keep going here, Mike. Yep. So uh, again, you know, working within this ecosystem, you know, my specialty was state, local, tribal, and territorial governments, but all the sectors have uh, periodically have to publish a sector specific plan SSP so it says an, an an annex to the NIPP the National Infrastructure Protection Plan is kind of the umbrella and then all of the critical sectors have their sector specific plans that feed up into it and so as you can see the last one that was developed was in 2015 now there was an update to it in 2020, but it's not really a significant update. What the update says is we want you to use the NIST cybersecurity framework to evaluate your risk. And when the, um, I think we all remember the colonial pipeline event of a few years ago, where we found out that the sector specific agency that has regulatory purview over pipelines was the Transportation Security Administration, the TSA. And so pipelines can't take off their shoes. And so the TSA had never told pipeline operators, uh, had given them any requirements to secure your cyber operations because your critical infrastructure. Well, when that happened, all of a sudden, we tore off the, you know, the, the scab here, started looking again at how we adjudicate infrastructure protection and what we communicate to the critical sectors and we're going back to this stuff now so 
pipelines, water, aviation, rail, and somebody else have, have recently been given um, new requirements from their sector specific agencies. And all of those are aligned with the use of the NIST cybersecurity framework. There is an emphasis on risk management and preparedness here. They, we keep saying the same thing over and over. This is a foreseeable event. You're not going to keep the bad guys out of your network if you have something they want really badly. All right. Some, uh, we'll, we'll throw USB sticks in your parking lot if we want into your network and we will get in. So the focus needs to be on monitoring, detection, investigation, confirmation, quarantine, right? The whole response uh, uh, chain of events there so that you can take that punch and get back up before the 10 count. That's what it's about. So when we say there's an emphasis in these plans on risk management and preparedness, that's what it means. Get ready to take a punch. You don't want that punch to put you out of business. And John Luke, you know, you, you know, you talk a lot about the NIST cybersecurity framework and, and making sure folks are managing that risk. I'm a big fan of the cybersecurity framework because it is a, a control structure which is not only favored by the government, by the Defense Department, you know, it, it helps establish standards that anybody can work with uh, within those fields, but it also translates to just about any other industry, public, private, or otherwise. Uh, and whether you're a large multinational manufacturing outfit with a headquarters in the US and manufacturing plants around the world, or you're a small 10 person machine shop in, in a, a rural area, the same controls are available to you. And the NIST cybersecurity framework helps expand and contract to, to right size based on what does your organization need. It doesn't say you have to have this technology and this software and go buy these products and spend this many millions of dollars in order to meet this minimum level of security. It says, these are the functions that we need to know you're achieving. How are you achieving these? How effective are you? And where are the opportunities for improvement? Uh, one of the things we've been talking about here, which you've heard Mike and Fred talk quite a bit about, is the supply chain. So, for example, in, in the cybersecurity framework, one of the first controls is identification. And this is identifying your assets, your network environment, but also your risks. And one of those risks, for example, is the supply chain. If you're a manufacturing outfit, you may be part of a supply chain for you know, an upstream organization. You take in raw components from downstream and you, you send them upstream, for example. Uh, but you also have your own supply chain, which needs to be addressed and managed and, and considered here. One of those is the availability of equipment. So for example, in traditional IT environments, if a system gets compromised, it's very common to just pull it off the network do some due diligence forensics, figure out how bad was the compromise, maybe restore from backup, maybe just wipe it and reload a clean OS, and then you put the application or the server back in service here. With some of the attacks and some of the compromises that we're talking about and that we've seen here, especially in manufacturing environments or in water systems or in other types of critical sectors, the equipment that they use is very specialized. So think about PLCs, logic controllers and device controllers and stuff here. Um, I, I have to give a hat tip because we were uh, working with Bjorn Towns and a colleague of ours on a, a, a tabletop exercise for a, a city government client of ours here last week. And one of the things that was brought up was if they needed to replace a bunch of their PLCs, a bunch of their control equipment, what would that lead time look like? Yes, there's a couple that are on a shelf here in case they need to you know, grab one and, and roll it out here. But overall, if they needed to order a half dozen new devices, they're looking at a lead time of potentially six to 18 months. So take something which is super critical to your manufacturing process, to the, the services that you're providing and delivering, to uh, the water systems, the traffic control systems, and then take that one device and make it unavailable. Say an intruder has managed to compromise the device or has managed to embed a firmware uh, vulnerability which told it to overwrite itself. Now the device itself is rendered useless. This isn't something you're gonna be running down to Best Buy or, or grabbing one off the shelf from your nearest electronics supplier. Again, this is potentially 12 to 18 months worth of lead time. And one of the things that came to light from that is it's because those devices are sharing chips with other consumer electronics platforms. And so, for example, Siemens S7, S7 controllers, excuse me, um, 
share certain chips with Ford F-150s and Sony Playstations. And so Ford and Sony consequently bought up all of those chips to go into their products because they are massive manufacturing outfits with global reach and, and massive consumer demand. But those chips are now not available for those PLC controllers. And so people who are ordering brand new equipment off the shelf for new projects, for you know setting up redundancies, for replacing aging infrastructure, for example, they're all looking at months and years worth of lead time uh, before they get new equipment in. And even then, that may not be all of the equipment you need to make it run. That could just be the beating heart of the controller. If you need additional devices or connectivity infrastructure, for example, that all may be another six months to a year out on top of that. And so there are these levels of supply chain risk, which go just beyond uh, needing to make sure you don't get fished by a vendor, needing to make sure that you know your, your organization uh, knows how to handle those, here's my new bank account information emails that Fred was talking about with business email compromise and the typical types of fraud that we see. Those are absolutely critical and, and must be managed, but there's this whole other world of risk, which IT in particular doesn't tend to think about because we're used to calling CDW. We're used to, you know, I need 10 servers and I need them here by Saturday. Here's my American Express card, like just make it happen and they will find a way. But if the equipment's literally not there, if the manufacturers aren't able to keep up with this, then there's there's very little hope of that being a, an instant recovery solution here. And so the cybersecurity framework, coming back to the home point here, uh, is a way of identifying those risks, not just in your supply chain, not just in your equipment availability, but in your entire infrastructure, in your ability to detect threats, in your ability to respond to those threats. It's not just a matter of, do you have somebody who's watching the email inbox at two o'clock in the morning, it's do you have somebody who's going to be able to take action based on the alerts that they see? Because if the types of risks that we're talking about here involve an intruder who's got an hour's worth of access to your OT environment, who's then able to start sending malicious commands, which will damage equipment, lock employees or administrators out of systems, or uh, in the case of Stuxnet, be showing you up on your displays that everything is hunky-dory. Meanwhile, you've got systems that are slowly imploding themselves in the background there. These are the kinds of things which are not gonna be recoverable just by restoring from a backup. Here we are talking about needing to replace very specific, very specialized equipment uh, with very high demands in a lot of industries here. So I, I am a very big proponent of using the cybersecurity framework to conduct an assessment across an organization. But it's very important that you look at your scope and you manage your scope carefully here because a lot of organizations will do a CSF security assessment, but essentially just look at the corporate side of things. They're just gonna look at the business operating environment. How are my laptops? protected? How is my Office 365 environment protected? That's all well and good. That does need to be done. But if you have OT, if you have these kinds of manufacturing processes or service delivery processes, and you use specific equipment or specific tools for delivering that, you have to make sure you take a look at that as well. One of the first slides that we had up talked about the, uh, uh, the IBM Threat Intel report and the number of incidents and how they occur. And the most common method was through phishing. So what that tells me is that most attacks are originating through email and social media and link-based attacks here. That gets them into an employee's laptop. That gets them into the corporate side of the network there. It has to be super difficult to let them into the operating technology environment. You have to have these segmentations in place, these firewalls up and these barricades, which prevent malware from an employee's computer, which they could pick up completely innocuously. We'd mentioned drive-by downloads, for example. You could just go to mycorporatewebsite.com and find yourself compromised on a, a computer in some way, shape or form. You have to have the controls in place to prevent that compromise from even being able to see, let alone reach and affect the OT environment. And so, Mike, can you talk a little bit about what's coming for, for manufacturing here? Yes. Um, so the CHIPS Act means that we are moving away from having semiconductor chips manufactured all over the world, for example, at TSMC in Taiwan, because Taiwan is uh, a, a, a bit of a hot button topic right now. Uh, but just, I mean, more broadly, we need to move manufacturing back in the United States. and We need to employ people making this stuff right here. So the CHIPS Act is a big part of this. And there are manufacturing plants going up in many states right now. Well, given the amount of intellectual property that's involved in semiconductor fabrication, they are targets. And given the importance that those chips are in, as we've discussed, right, if you're an automobile manufacturer and that chip plant in Phoenix uh, gets smacked, you're not making cars. 
so um, they are definitely going to be under a microscope. And, and in fact, during the, the construction process, they are under a microscope. Um, so that's one thing that we're going to have to keep in mind is the fact that as we move more manufacturing back onshore, more broadly, not just chips, but as we move more manufacturing back in the United States, um, they're going to be the object of desire of other countries. Uh, more robotic manufacturing, we talked about that. The, the bigger you make your attack surface, the more opportunities there are for someone. Um, artificial intelligence that nobody understands being baked into your manufacturing process to get it to be semi-autonomous and create even more efficiencies in there, that's going to create an attack surface. And then more regulation for critical infrastructure. It is goes without saying that um, uh, we're not going to stop telling people that they have to uh, secure your networks. And so that's going to be done in a variety of ways. What this should boil down to for you and everyone is this. Managing the risk around these things, there are these two terms you worry about. One is the likelihood of a bad thing happening. What's a bad thing? It's all the things we just talked about. It's records disclosure and theft and extortion and disruption and et cetera, et cetera, right? right? To buy down risk by addressing the likelihood term, you deploy preventive controls. And so there are a number of preventive controls that we all know about in IT networks. For example, filter your email. You know, for me, it's like, don't use, let your users use the internet at all, right? Make Facebook live on phones, right? Those are all preventive controls to reduce that likelihood and you will never reduce the likelihood to zero. After that, you need to worry about managing the impact of these events. Again, this is a foreseeable event in the 21st century. And if you are caught unprepared, it is going to be on you. It's you, You're not going to be able to say, we did everything we could to prevent this. And God, wow, it happened and we got crushed. You got to have that plan for what you're going to do when it happens. Take that punch. That's probably the biggest uh, uh, piece of advice we can give anybody. Fred, you want to go through this real quick? Sure. So what, what do you do to understand your problem and, and treat these risks? First, if you don't know what you have, then you're blind. Uh, as John Luke mentioned, the very first step in the cybersecurity framework is at inventory of your assets and systems. Understand deeply what you have deployed out there. Understand where it is, what kind of software versions are on there. How you connect to these systems is critically important. We talked about a VPN remote access being a great vector for the bad guys to take. So you need to think about having multi-factor authentication in every step where you're doing system administration. Even if you're inside your network and you're using admin credentials, you should be using multi-factor authentication. Same thing for any vendors that you have that come in to service these technologies. Make sure that you know what they're doing. They're not bringing their devices that are unclean and haven't been scanned onto your network or plugging their USB devices into your technology so they can upgrade firmware. Buy a USB stick, hand it to them, and tell them that's the only one they're allowed to use. Um, vulnerability management. You need to know what kind of vulnerabilities are on, not just your IT, but all your manufacturing equipment. As I said, these are older systems, longer life spans. They tend not to get patched. They tend to require a vendor to patch it, or they need actually a firmware update. It's not just running a patch. I got to go connect to the machine and actually update the firmware in that system. And one of the more difficult things is monitoring and incident response. How do you know when bad things are happening? Well, you need you need to rely on network detection and response controls. There is, you know, unless it's a Windows systems, you're not going to be installing an in endpoint detection and response agent or even AV on those endpoints. So you need a way to watch the network to understand what's anomalous, what looks like attack traffic, what kinds of things should not be happening there. You need to be able to respond. Most people know how to go and rebuild a system. What does it mean to bring an operational technology network and all the devices and PLCs and process controllers out there? What does it mean to bring those back online if they've been attacked? Ransomware is not uncommon, by the way, on these types of devices because they're not well secured and it's easy to, to lock them down. And your best friend, as Mike and John Luke were saying, is segmentation. Any of these devices that are older, that can't be patched, that can't have an agent, put them on their own network and segment that off and make sure that they're not communicating out to the internet. There is almost never a reason for operational devices to be speaking out to the internet. And if it is, it should only be back to the manufacturer or a software as a service maybe it's sending its information to. Everything else should not be allowed. 
And then there's the whole concept of what does it mean to secure operational technology? This stuff was not necessarily built with security as a for, as a, a forefront in my or for mine. And the technologies and protocols they use are old and poorly secured. There are ways to fix this. There are ways to add network controls. There's at ways to add overlay encryption on top of this. They're finally getting smart. Maybe it's time to upgrade to do some OT devices that actually have security as a primary part of their build. And, you know, I think, you know, when you, when you look at that and you think, all right, you know, how am I going to tackle this? You know, one of the things we do for folks is provide the, you know, provide that outside uh, layer so that we can help folks as a service. So, you know, we talked about those security assessments, you know, we can help you with those. The, we talked about, um, uh, you know, penetration testing. We talked about compliance. Um, you know, that detection that Fred talked about is in the middle. And if you don't have 24 7, you know, 365, you know, uh, detection, um, you know, managed detection response, um, some people call it SOC as a service. Um, you know, we can do that for you. Some other folks uh, don't have MDR for IoT and OT, and that's something that we do for folks. So um, my colleague Ginny is going to put a link in the chat uh, for a meeting if you want to sit down with Fred uh, and, and Mike and JLP and talk about how, uh, you know, how to leverage those services. You know, we're here for you. Um, and happy to do that. The other link that my colleague Jenny is going to put in the chat is the survey. Um, at the end of every event, we put in a survey. We'd love your opinions. Uh, how was this? Was this helpful? Um, and, uh, you know, we'd appreciate it if you take that. So link number one is that Calendly link. My, uh, 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 it, you know, if you want to talk about how to get uh, some of those services uh, for your organization, get that risk assessment, get that 24-7, 365 SOC monitoring, you know, we're here for you. Um, and uh, uh, and we'd love to talk to you about it. But everybody should absolutely take that survey. We want to know, was this helpful? Did we cover the right information um, as well? Also, um, you know, we do biweekly security awareness training. Uh, there's a link on our website to it. Um, and we'd love to have you send your folks. Uh, you can send everybody. It's free. We're happy to do it for you. Um, and uh, that is every other Friday, including this coming Friday. Um, and if you want our email addresses, uh, they are there. You can email me anytime, jake at criticalinsight.com. Sadly, I answer 24-7. Uh, Mike answers less frequently, but that's uh, that's his email address as well. Um, if you have any questions, now is a good time to put them in the chat. Happy to answer your questions. Um, other than that, we'll do uh, some final thoughts here. One minute each, John Luke, and then Mike, and then Fred. John Luke, what do you got? Anybody who's taken management training has probably heard of the plan, do, check, act cycle. Uh, take that and apply it to cybersecurity assessments. Do a CSF assessment, check it, act on it, and then do it again. And it's that constant cycle of continuous improvement where you're going to identify risks and you're going to keep improving your security of the organization time and time again. So everybody that's uh, been part of the DOD knows about the OODA loop. Observe, orient, decide, act. <laughs> Since you brought it up, that's not really my final thought. My final thought is the best thing that you can do for yourself is stay aware of what's coming out of the federal government because they're going to be telling you things that you need to do and they're going to start checking work. One of the things that they say about this big infrastructure protection ecosystem is we have to monitor better how these things are working. And so there's the likelihood of audit coming up. Um, other than that, it's a foreseeable event. Get ready to take a punch and hopefully it won't knock you out for good. All right, Fred, close us out. Yep. So when you're doing your risk assessment, consider those external factors. It's the things that you don't have control over that could put you out of business or curtail your operation. So understand those risks. Try to find out mitigating measures. Maybe it's alternate suppliers, but understand it's not just you that can bring your business down. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Hopefully uh, we gave you some information that helps you. Um, and, uh, you know, we look forward to talking to you. Please hit those links that uh, uh, that Jenny put in the chat, certainly the survey. And if you want to meet with us, hit that uh, hit that link for the Calendly. Um, and we'll talk to everybody later. Thanks for joining us. Bye bye. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Take care, everybody.